Dear sisters and brothers in Christ, on this joyful Easter Sunday, grace to you and peace from God the Father and from our risen and living Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Good morning. morning. Happy Happy Easter. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Alleluia. Alleluia. Look at how beautiful this sanctuary is. Look how beautiful the music has been this morning. Even more, though, think about how beautiful the promise of Easter is for all of us. This day that marks the centerpiece of not just our faith, but our lives. I have always loved the little uh, answer that one little girl gave to a question that was asked of her on Easter Sunday one year. Somebody had said, what do you, what do you think Jesus said when he first came out of the tomb? Because we never hear that in the Bible, right? So the, he said, what do you think Jesus said uh, when he came out of the tomb on that first Easter morning? This little girl thought about it for just a little se- second, and then she said, I think he said, ta-da! <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'd like to believe that that's true. <laughs> a good Easter hymn goes like this. The strife is over. The battle done. Now is the victor's triumph won. Now the song of praise begun. Alleluia. We can't deny it. In fact, we don't want to deny it either that all of our praise today comes at the cost of Jesus' sacrificial love. To take on our sin and pain and the evil of the world and lay down his life to it. Our praise comes at that cost. God, though, raised him to new life over all of that. And that's why we're here. The strife is over. In God's world that we live in, no more will be driven by our sin or pain or by evil or by death. That stuff is not in charge at all and neither are we, thank goodness. The world is driven instead by a force of God and the force is called resurrection. The power of new life. That's God's force that is at work in our world now and drives the world. This year, there couldn't be a better contrast, I think, to Easter than the uh, Hunger Games. I want a show of hands. How many of you have read any of the Hunger Games books? Wow. How about the, how about the movie? How many of you have seen the movie? Okay, so we've got a good share that have already understood how phenomenal of a force this book and this movie is. I gobbled it up. I, I couldn't put the first book down. I'm into the second now, but I had to read the first book so that I could see the movie and see how it, how it went. In the storyline of The Hunger Games, there are some real deep human themes, unfulfilled love, and politics, and social stratification, and even sacrifice. When a young girl named Katniss takes her sister's place and risks losing her life as kids are forced to battle each other to the death. The premise of the book is really incredibly unsettling. However, it's just written in an incredibly uh, good way as well. But the most prominent theme in the Hunger Games is the power of hopelessness. The strife of powerlessness and being vulnerable and feeling deadened inside can cause us to do not only desperate things, but also simply in this life to give up and to be emptied of life and emptied of faith and emptied of love. It's just gone. The Hunger Games was about the people of a nation, for those of you who haven't read it, participating in their own destruction because their Hope had been ripped away by those in power in that nation. Hopelessness is the opposite of faith in the resurrection. 
Hopelessness is the opposite of faith in the resurrection. Hopelessness is believing that the force of God's power of new life in our lives, real power, is not real and is not here and is not possible. That's what hopelessness is. So what if we lived without hope that Christ was raised? And what if we thought that God didn't breathe the power of resurrection into life and into our lives every single day? What if we didn't believe that? Do we live that way sometimes? Perhaps the Hunger Games actually is us where our struggles blind us to hope and they starve us of being at peace. We know those places in ourselves, especially if we're willing to name them. Anger, broken relationships, our own sin, guilt that we carry, emptiness, fear, needing to be cherished, but not by someone else. In fact, and I think here's one of the truths that we fail to remember so often, and it's liberating for us. Every Sunday and in every church, there is a whole congregation of us starving for the gospel of Jesus Christ. True. That his dying and rising makes rising from our own deaths possible. And rising from daily brokenness, possible. And that in the depth of God's force of love for the world, he holds you and he looks into your eyes and into your soul and he tells you again that he is what you need. Grace, forgiveness, and the fact that he will renew your life. He will. This is what all of our churches are for. We all equally need this hope that transforms us. And in our Easter faith, we joyfully, hopefully, share this gift together with every seeking soul who walks through the door, this church and every other church that we're a part of. Here's what I want you to do right now. I want you to breathe in real deeply. Go ahead. Just breathe in real deeply. I want you to breathe in not just the promise, but also the force of God's real work of resurrection. And I want you to believe that this force lives in you, and even more, that it defines you. Resurrection. Perhaps right now even, that it transforms you. And I want you to know that this is faith in the living God. And if he is alive, then he is giving new life to people also. And I want you to see that at the end of the gospel today, as well as in the other two lessons that were read, those who were disciples of Jesus are commanded to be witnesses to everyone that the resurrection is real, that Christ has been raised from the dead, and that New life, not hopeless wasting. But new life is God's force at work in the world and in you. You and I are commanded to witness boldly to the resurrection that we just breathed into our bodies and minds and souls and perspectives and actions and lives, our whole selves. Listen to this incredible and true story. In the winter of 1982, then Vice President George Bush represented the United States at the funeral of former Soviet leader Leonid Brezhnev. Bush was moved by a silent protest by Brezhnev's widow. She stood by his casket motionless until just seconds before it closed. Then, just as the soldiers who were there touched the lid to close it, Brezhnev's wife performed an act of great courage and hope 
a gesture that must surely rank as one of the most profound acts of civil disobedience ever committed. She reached down and made the sign of the cross on her husband's chest. There in the citadel of secular, atheistic power, the wife of the man who ran it all hoped that her husband was wrong. She hoped that there was another life and that that life was best represented by Jesus who died on the cross for our sin. And that that same Jesus might yet have mercy on her husband. She knew that life was not defined by death. She knew there was one who was resurrected and she hoped that her husband might be also. This is the force of resurrection. The hope it brings transforms people, breathes new life into people. And in the end, that new life comes out as joy for us. A little boy was watching a depiction of Jesus' crucifixion on TV with his family. He had tears just streaming down his face when it happened and when Jesus was buried. Then though, all of a sudden, he jumped up off the couch and a big smile broke out on his face and he shouted out, now comes the good part. <laughs> yes. May Christ's resurrection be the force that transforms you and transforms us and humbly even through us transforms the world. Amen. Amen.